try to mirror the desktop just a second. And I'm also trying to video everything so you can share them with co-workers and, and friends after the meetup. That we don't have a page. Yes. Okay, so today I'll be giving you an introduction to reactive programming with ArcJS and Angular 2. My name is Carl, and uh, uh, well, Finnish people call me Kalle. So, but you can call me Carl or Kalle, whatever. I'm from. A, I work for a company called W3 Group, and uh, we are also recruiting. So, if you're interested in doing work with Angular or even Angular 2. We have something and check out the URL if, if you're interested. And uh, I'm also on Twitter and GitHub and I have a blog. Not that much uh, post lately, but maybe something in the future. And uh, yeah, so okay, Reactive is, uh, it's, it's, as the name implies, it's co code that uh, reacts, reacts to changes instead of like where in imper imperative the code executes linearly. So uh, with that we have a, a project called ReactiveX or just Rx and its website says that it's an API for asynchronous programming with observable streams and that's something that we are going to learn about today. And it's not only JavaScript related, it's available for many different languages, and mostly with languages that have some asynchronous stuff already. So you can check out, they have quite similar APIs to all of these different languages. And it was uh, originally uh, founded by a guy called Eric Meyer when he was working at Microsoft, but it's not really related to Microsoft anymore, it's open source project and different parts have been contributed by different companies. For example, Netflix uses extensively Rx technologies and, they, and the Rx Java is mostly contributed by Netflix. So it's really open source thing and for example, if you know Andre Staltz who f works at uh, Futurist, he's, he's uh, contributing to RxJS for example. So, and for JavaScript, we also have other frameworks that bring the reactive programming paradigm like uh, Bacon JS. So it's pretty similar. So RxJS is not the only option you have, but uh, if you are working with Angular 2, then RxJS is obviously the way to go. With uh, reactive programming, Everything is a stream, like a, a stream of values over time. So you can think think about uh, kind of like uh, what the uh, streams are in real world. Like for example, today here I am speaking words are, are kind of like a stream of words that I'm speaking to you. Uh, more computer related stuff. The mouse position, for example, is a, is a stream, and uh, keyboard keys can be thought of as a stream of values over time, and uh, uh, network requests can be modeled as a stream, and uh, everything like we have uh, mobile phones, which have different sensors like GPS and uh, gyroscope and stuff like that, and all of those values can be modeled as a stream. So it's kind of like a little bit like a collection of values, but not exactly. It's a little bit different. And uh, as I said, the, the streams are everywhere. And when you are doing reactive programming, you have to start thinking in terms of streams to, so that you can reason about them successfully. And uh, there are most of the stuff, like especially the asynchronous stuff, can be modeled as a stream. And uh, so there are actually two types of streams in like 
computer science theory, iterable stream and uh, observable stream. Iterable streams are more like you can fetch values whenever you want, more like uh, just basic iterator. And uh, observable streams are the streams that, that ArcJS is, is about. So this is what we are going to focus on today. And uh, the difference is that they will emit values whenever they happen without you ask, asking for them. So that's something you have to be aware of. It's kind of like uh, iterable streams are like pool. You pull values when you want, but observable streams, they will emit values whether you want them or not, or even if you can't handle them, they just keep on coming. So that's something you have to be aware of. So you, stuff like that doesn't happen to you. <laughs> yeah, so this is kind of like a pseudo code, maybe more close to Java, but it defines the observable class, which is the kind of like the heart of everything. And uh, it has a method called subscribe, which takes an observer as a parameter. And the observer has three methods, kind of like callbacks, like the most useful is the on next, which is what will get called on every time the stream emits a new value. Then also errors can happen, so there's an error method, and also the stream can complete when it doesn't have any more values. So the observer has three different kinds of callbacks. And we also get a subscription of facts, so you can later unsubscribe from the stream. In uh, JavaScript, it's pretty much the same thing. It's uh, the observable is is a uh, is a class, and in the prototype, it has a subscribe method, which takes an observer, and the observer has the same methods. But also in JavaScript, we have kind of like the short shorthand way of just calling the subscribe and giving it a callback function so we don't have to actually make an observer object. We can just give it callbacks functions, which is more, more like the way you're used to maybe working with promises. So you can think of the subscribe method as a kind of like a, the 10 method of a promise, only that the, the on next will get called multiple times. So the observer, observable is kind of like a <coughs> hybrid of the observer pattern or and the iterator pattern in, in, in comparison. Also, it's kind of like uh, you can also think about it as uh, similar to promise, but only look for a collection of values. So it will get called mo multiple times, and then you also have the completed callback, which is something that promise or in promises you have finally, which is pretty much similar. Okay, so the most important thing is that when you're doing reactive programming, you have to start thinking in terms of streams. And uh, the difference with working like uh, regular collections, like arrays or, or maps or something like that, is that uh, you can't, there's no underlying data structure that you can access. You can't get the previous values. You don't know how many values you're going to get over time. You only get the value when it when they happen. So, as Dalai Lama has said, we have to focus on the present moment and that moment alone. So, so uh, it's a little bit different. So, something you need to be aware of. And uh, when we are working with observables, we also can transform them. Functional programming, you, you work with collections and you have stuff like map and reduce and stuff like that that you use to transform the collections to different kind of collections. And that's pretty similar with observables. As uh, observables also have many of the same kind of operators, map, reduce, filter, scan, merge, different many, many operators that can be used to transform the observable, or transform the stream to 
new, new stream. And observables are immutable, so you always get new stream, a new observable back from calling these operators. And there are quite a lot of them, actually many, many, many more than can fit in this one slide. So it's not that you have to learn all of them by heart, you just need to learn where you can look them up and decide which are you going to use in every specific case. So, and there are actually the RxJS library is split into kind of like a light version that has only a, the most used ones and then the full version that has all of them because there are so many so most people don't always need all of them. But uh, we'll see in a little bit how this works. Uh, <coughs> One common way to visualize how this work is using these diagrams called marble diagrams. There's a website for it called rxmarbles.com. And uh, here the horizontal line represents time and all of the dots represents values emitted by the observable. The x represents an error and the vertical line represents the stream completing. So let's see a few of those diagrams here. We have uh, the source stream above, which, where different values get emitted. Then we have a, a filter method applied to it, where we want only values that are bigger than 10. And underneath, we see what, what kind of stream we get back. So this is really useful way of uh, visualizing how, how the operators work. and. Uh, it's helpful when you're debugging, for example, because with asynchronous code and all the RxJS library, it's not that useful using like a traditional step debugger because it's going, it's not that useful. You don't see the flow that easily, so it's sometimes easier to just kind of draw a picture of it or something like that <coughs> so that you, you see where the, what happens and what all is. You get, you're going to get, or what do you want? And uh, let's see a few more. Here's the map. Just transform the value and give it, the, give it at the same time. Up and then we have different kinds of uh, operators. For example, debounce is uh, something that uh, keeps the values for uh, for a specific amount of time before emitting them, but if a new value comes during that time, it starts the timer again and discards the previous value. So sometimes if you, if you think back on the dog video, sometimes this is really helpful. You're not interested in each of the specific values, you're just interested that something happened and now I want the latest one. So. These diagrams on the Arch Marbles site are interactive, as you can see here. You can move them around to see what happens in different situations. In this case, you can see that when these values come here between these, this time frame that the debounce is emitting the value, then it will discard the previous one. And uh, sometimes this can be also helpful for debugging because sometimes <coughs> if you have the time too long, it, you actually will never never get anything if these keep coming too frequently or something like that. So they can be useful for that kind of stuff also to, to help you visualize it. Then you have also operators that will merge multiple streams together. Something like mer merge is just emitting all of the values as they're coming in the source streams or you can chip them together so that you always get a pair of values. And uh, also, th these kind of operators that uh, keep values in memory for a little while, as you can see here, if this stream emits values more frequently than the other one, if you imagine that this would keep emitting values here every so frequently, then this emits more less frequently, then you only get 
these values when this one emits. So that uh, actually the chip operator would have to keep all of the values that this one has emitted in memory. So if you keep running that for a long time, you are going to leak memory at some point. So just something also that you need to be aware of when you're working with combining operators. And then we have a kind of like a aggregate operators that will only emit one value when the source stream completes. For example, we can count, or there are also others like uh, reduce, where only only one value will be emitted when the source stream completes, which might be useful at some time. And these kind of like marble diagrams can also be done in ASCII format, where, for example, in this here we have a stream of lowercase letters, then we map them to uppercase, then we delay them a little bit, and then we only take the first three. So this is kind of a nice way to visualize it so that you can understand what happens and uh, maybe discuss with colleagues or something like that. It's a more visual way to understand what, what's happening. And uh, it's also quite in interesting that the RxJS uh, project has uh, done a way that they can, are using this ASCII type of representing streams for unit testing. They have methods that can convert this ASCII representation into, a, into an actual stream that they can use for unit testing and then compare it to some, something like source stream. <coughs> and uh, that's a really cool way of, of writing tests, I think, and uh, they also uh, generate kind of like this type of uh, diagrams from the ASCII representation automatically for documentation, so it's really, really useful. And I think they are also working on an API for uh, user land to write unit tests, tests with uh, ASCII representation, so it's something that, that looks interesting. So. I haven't done anything like that myself yet, but yeah. Okay, let's look a little bit, oh, one more thing before looking at, at uh, actual <coughs> code examples. Uh, the observables come in two flavors, hot and cold. And uh, the hot one means that uh, each subscription will get the same values. So, for example, if we go back to the speaker an analogy, for example, now I am speaking here, and each of you are hearing the same words at the same time when I when I speak them. So I could be considered as a hot observable. And uh, if you then uh, take a video of this presentation uh, so that people can watch it later from YouTube, for example, then that video would be a cold observable because all of the observers, at the watchers, will get their own stream. They can they can start it at different times, and they can they are totally independent of of, uh, of each other. So it's uh, they are not shared, and uh, each subscriber gets their own values. So, for example, uh, a keyboard or a mouse is a hot observable because it's only happening once and the mouse is only at one place at one time. But uh, for example, a timer is a cold observable, so that e each time you subscribe to it, you get the new timer that starts from zero. So that's, that's also something that you need to be aware of, because uh, sometimes you want observables to be hot and sometimes you want them to be cold, and there are ways to convert them, but you just have to know, know how that works. and. Uh, be aware of it. So let's look at some code. Uh, here we have a uh, very simple timer observable. So we create the observable with interval of one second, and we only take the first five values, and then we subscribe to it and print the output. And Nothing that special about it, but if we add another subscriber to it, 
with uh, one and a half second timeout. What happens then is that uh, the second subscription is going to get its own set of values starting from zero at the 1.5 second mark. So if we want them to have the same values, we can share this original observable by calling share. So now if we run it, we can see that the values start at zero and then after the second subscription, they get the same values at the same time. Okay. Here is a <coughs> example where we create uh, an observable from DOM event. So we have the from event method on the observable where we give a target element and the event we want to listen for. In this case, key up. And then we map because we get the whole event object from which is normally from a DOM event and we're only interested in the actual key codes so we map it then we are only interested for example in the alphabetic letters and numbers and not like a control alt s cross or any special characters so we can filter it and then we are not really interested in those numeric key codes because we are humans we are understand those actual key codes or you know, the characters better so we map them again to get the actual character and then finally we subscribe to it and again print so if we run this and I type something we get that output <coughs> now one uh, way to also debug with observables is using an operator called do which is kind of like a common way to say that here I can do side effects and it will not actually modify the stream in any way so we can do something like <coughs> this and now if we run this we will get the actual keys and then I when I press some other characters you see that uh, for example control or backspace we see that the do will get executed but the filter will filter them out so that they won't go any further than that and this is useful for debugging when for example you have written uh, application and you have wired some some things together and then nothing happens and you're wondering why why is nothing happening then you can just put do statements somewhere in there to see if they actually get executed at all because one thing to keep in mind <coughs> is that observables are lazy nothing nothing will happen if there's no subscription so if you if, if we take this one if we comment this out and execute so now you might expect the do still to print something but uh, nothing actually happens because they are lazy so the whole observable will do nothing because there is no subscription uh, one more example here is uh, now we create a clickstream event by, by listening for the click DOM event. Uh, this dollar sign here is just a, uh, it's a naming convention that some people use that you, they suffix all of the observables with the dollar sign to just donate their uh, streams. So just need to know if you see, see some code that uses that naming convention. But here we create a click stream. Then what we do is uh, we then want to get the click count during a specific time frame. For example, here we take 500 milliseconds, so we use debounce. 
and then buffer them the values during that time frame. So we will get a list of events that happened during <coughs> that time frame, and then we can get the length of the list. So when we run this, we get the this we we can then uh, take the click count stream and further modify it by using multiple different filters and then each of them have their own subscribers so here you can see that it's it's uh, immutable in a way that uh, calling filter here will will not interfere with this one here and each will get their own own observable that they subscribe to so it works and you can you can put as many subscriptions as you want and uh, as many operators as you want to modify modify those streams to something useful so in a way reactive programming is, is that we take small and simple events and compose them or transform transform them to create more complex events like in the previous example, we took a simple click stream and then we modified it to create a double click, click event, for example, or something like that. So let's take a look at Angular 2 then. That was just Rx previously, so it applies to, you can use it with any other framework or any, without any framework, you can just use it in any way you like. But in Angular 2, it has a dependence into RxJS, so it's used in Angular 2 internally, and there are also a few points where it's exposed to the users of the framework, so we'll concentrate, concentrate on those points today. It uses the new version 5 of RxJS, it's still in beta, but I think there's not that much difference to previous versions, so it's pretty much compatible. It has some improvements for debugging, so it's, it produces more useful stack traces, for example. So it's, it's a, a good update in that regard. Uh, so I'm not going to go too deep to the Angular 2 syntax here. So if you don't know Angular 2 at all, so some of this might look foreign, but you can look them up later. or. or or something like that, but focus on here is, is on, on observables, so we'll try to focus on those. One of the things that Angular 2 has is a thing called async pipe. Pipes are like what filters are in, in Angular 1. And async pipe is a way that you can subscribe to the observable in the template, so you don't have to subscribe it in your controller and store the values in some other intermediary variable and that you are going to use in the view. You can just uh, put the, the observable into a property and then straight in the template you can use it by giving it to the async pipe. And as you can see here in this example, you can use it stand alone with the single value or you can use it also with ng4 for example if you have an observable that returns an array in this case we have a title which is an observable of a string and then we have items which is an observable of an array of strings so we give the items to the ng4 and it will then handle all of the iterating for when a new array comes from the observable. And one thing that's really useful with the async pipe is that it allows us to use the on push change detection strategy. If you don't know what that means, don't worry about it, but it's just a way to make uh, Angular 2 more performant by notifying the framework that this component here, you don't need to check it every time you run change detection, the async pipe will notify when a new value has been emitted by the observable, 
and it, it will mark mark it for change detection. So it's just uh, less work for Angular on every time your application does something. So something you you might want to be aware of. And uh, there are ways that you can do it. You use the on push strategy by <coughs> notifying it yourself, but just the async pipe will do it for you, so it's really easy to use that way. Uh, another, another way we can use observables is with the ng form control. Uh, if we have a, an input field, we can use the ng form control directive here and then create a new control. And after that, this will be an object that has a property called value changes, which is an observable for the input element values. We can also do quite similar things by ourselves. If we want to, we can get hold of the actual DOM element in Angular 2 by giving it a reference in the template and then using a view child decorator. And then we will get hand handle on the native DOM element. And then we can use it as we saw in the previous examples before Angular 2, we just had the Rx observable from a DOM element and give it an element. So in this, this way we can use the native element and create whatever observables we, we want. One thing to note is that uh, Angular 2 template will not be initialized when the constructor of this controller runs. So we can't use this in the constructor. We have to use a lifecycle hook called ng after view in it, which is a point in time when the template has been initialized. So we actually have a DOM, a DOM element. But this, this is pretty much the same thing as uh, as this one. We get the, an observable for the input element value. Then one more thing is the HTTP service, which is kind of like equivalent to Angular 1 dollar HTTP, which most of you probably are familiar with. And the difference is that in Angular 2, it will give you an observable instead of a promise. So in this example, we are just making a get request here to GitHub, GitHub API. And then we get an observable back, with, which we then map by getting the JSON content from the response. And then this is something that's specific to the way that the GitHub API gives us our results, but we are just interested in creating a list of uh, an array of usernames. Uh, one thing to note here is that uh, the share method at the end is uh, that the HTTP request observables are also called by default. So if you subscribe to them multiple times, you will actually make multiple network requests, which is something you don't want to do in most cases. So you need to be aware of that. And most of the time, you just it's just enough that you call share at the end. So if you subscribe to it multiple times, all of them will get the same, same observable back. OK. Now let's look a little more comprehensive example by putting all of this together. Here we are creating a simple autocomplete component. We have a 
a template where there's one input element and then a list uh, of suggestions. And uh, we are using the form control here so that we get uh, value changes in the input field in an observable. Then if you know what way a normal autocomplete works, it doesn't make a new network request on every keystroke. It actually waits a little bit for you to stop typing. So we use debounce here so that we only we wait for 400 milliseconds before uh, or after each time the value changes and then only continue when, when it has stayed quiet for 400 milliseconds. Then we also trim the keyword because we are not interested in white space before or after it. And then we filter because we don't want to do requests on uh, empty, empty keywords. And then we also use something called distinct until change because if, if we only type like a white space after it, the trim will take them out, but it will still continue on. But we are not interested in making new network requests for a keyword that's the same as the previous one. And finally, in this map, we will use our GitHub search service from the previous slide, so actually this one, to make the actual network requests. And uh, if you look at the return type here, it's an observable of array. So actually what we have at this point is uh, an observable of observables, which is not something that we usually want. So there are many operators also in RxJS that allow you to transform those back to a single observable. Most used one is, I guess, flatmap, which will just subscribe to each of the observables and emit the values as they come in from all of them. We could also use, use flatmap here, and it would work pretty well. But uh, one thing is that uh, if we make network requests every 400 milliseconds, for example, it's not guaranteed in that they, the responses will come back in the exact same order that we sent them. So we could be creating a race condition where we overwrite the return value with the, from an earlier request. So we, the switch uh, operator here does a thing that uh, it will discard of the previous one when a new one comes and subscribe to that one. So we are only interested in the response values from the latest network request. And what we get is something like this. We can, oh, oh yeah, I don't have network over there. <laughs> I don't have Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi, it's a uh, more guest. It doesn't have a password. Okay, let's see. Nope. <laughs> okay. You can imagine lists coming from <laughs> <laughs> It did work when I last mm. tried. Yeah. Uh, but that's pretty much it. So in just a few lines of code, we can create a complicated thing like uh, an autocomplete that if you compare it to something like uh, jQuery autocomplete, which is like 643 lines of code or UI bootstrap autocomplete, which is like 400 and something lines of code. It's does pretty much the same thing in just a few lines of code. So that kind of demonstrates the power of RxJS or the re reactive programming paradigm in, in, a, in this way. When you have simple events, 
and turn them into more complicated events. In this case, we take the keystroke events from the keyboard and we transform them on and on in, and combine it with the network request. And finally, we get a list of, of uh, suggestions, which is the, what we actually want. Let's try it one more time. Yeah, not, okay. Yeah, you could try to go to the previous page. Well, yeah, well, it's not that important, I guess. <laughs> Also, uh, you can think of the, the components or services and stuff like that you build in, in Angular 2 uh, as, uh, as black boxes so that it, it's, it help, it's helpful for, for having all of the dependencies between the components as observable so you can have like ugly imperative code inside the component, but if, if the output is just a beautiful stream of values, it's it's more easier to reason about that, that and it simplifies kind of like the, all the, the dependency graphs and stuff like that. So in, in Angular 2, it's, it's kind of forcing you that way anyway, because the component, you have to define your outputs. So it's going in that direction, but it's useful for also your own like Data services and stuff like that to use use observables for for the outputs, and you can have whatever kind of code inside. But it simplifies if you if you use it that way. Okay, let's look now a, a little bit more comprehensive demo. Uh, this um, when I started thinking about what kind of demo I would do. Uh, I thought about what would be a good example of, of uh, reactive programming and uh, as uh, for example S. Font said in the last meetup if you were present, the Excel or spread, spreadsheet is kind of like the mother of all reactive applications where you uh, change the values in those cells and everything else that, use, that uses those values will react to that changes. So I decided to do Excel in Angular 2. So let's see how it goes. <laughs> this is pretty much the, from the Angular quick start of this thing, so not that interesting. Just setting it up. Here is a, our root component, which just bootstraps Angular, and then have, has one component here called Excel. In this one, we have a, a table. <coughs> we define a few columns and a few rows. And then in the table, we loop them over to create an Excel-like table. And uh, each of those, so here, here we loop further rows, and then we loop the columns inside each of them, and then we de define a cell that we give an ID. And the cell uh, looks like this. It, it has a template with an input element and an output element, or just a div that has a class output. And uh, then there's some styles to kind of like put them on top of each other. So we actually have uh, the input and output, they have both the same size and, and they are on top of each other. The output element will be on front because it's later in the DOM. But uh, we set pointer events to none, so actually mouse clicks will go through that element into the input that's behind it. And whenever the input gets focus, we will hide the output. Just some little trick to make it look like an Excel with two elements in the DOM. Uh, we can just see what it looks like real quick here. Okay, this is the output. So we have a 
something that we can put values in, inside here. Whoa, nice. Uh, but the actual stuff that's going on is, is uh, we have this form for the input. We call it a formula. And then we listen to the value changes on that one. And then we also have a, a spreadsheet service as a dependency for, for this one. And uh, we also get uh, updates from the spreadsheet when other cells update their value. So we are interested in uh, getting only, only those updates that we are using in the formula of this cell. And this will create an update stream and we then take the update stream and use the spreadsheet service to have evaluate the formula of this cell every time something happens like basically whenever I edit the formula of this cell or whenever the values change for other cells that are used in the formula of this cell uh, to, to we combine those it's, it's the with latest from and combine latest here there are two times when we want to update our, our cell and this uh, spreadsheet will handle the evaluation of the values. We'll check that out in a minute. And um, finally we subscribe to it. Or in, the, in, the, in here we send updates to the spreadsheet so that it can notify other cells again. And this makes our Excel work so that we can, for example, type here A1 times 6 is 24. And now if we change this, that one will get changed automatically. So it's reactive Excel written in Angular 2. And we can also check out the spreadsheet service, what it looks like. It, uh, we are using a, uh, a scan operator here to get all of the updates and uh, accumulate a, a context object, object that will hold the latest, latest value of each cell so that we can use them when we evaluate another cell's value that's using them. And then we have some really quick and dirty stuff for <laughs> evaluating, <coughs> which I'm not that proud of. But I, I couldn't find a, a dollar parse equivalent from Angular 2 yet, so I just rolled my own. <laughs> <laughs> if you're interested, I can show you, but it's, it's somewhere here. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's just something like that. <coughs> Don't use, <laughs> but it works. So, in this object, we are accumulating all the values from each of the cells, with uh, the cell ID being the key and then the value. So we get an object where there's like a1 is four and b1 is twenty four and stuff like that. And well, Excel wouldn't really be that useful if you can only do basic arithmetic, the, all of the useful things come from using different functions. So we can also quickly implement something like that here. The, this context is, is like the evaluation context for all, all of those cells. So we can add some functions here, for example. We can do a quick sum function.
like this and uh, now this uh, this should update oh I, I just didn't save okay now yeah so now we can do like a one times two and then a one plus b one and then in here we can do for example some a1, b1, c1, ta-da. Quick and simple Excel written in a few lines of Angular 2. <laughs> okay, so that's all I had to say. There are some useful links here. There's a link to the, the bottom one is for the example that I just showed if you want to take a closer look at it on your own time. Uh, probably too much Oric stuff in one go for really understanding what's happening. But uh, as I said earlier, you don't have to go like full reactive with everything from the get-go. You can do like... Uh, ugly imperative go code inside and then just use observables for communicating with other parts of your application and stuff like that it will make it useful actually like for data data services when you write them in angular 2 it's kind of like a good pattern to use use the observables for that and you, then you can use for example the async pipe and use make it the uh, own push strategy to make it more performant and stuff like that so there are some useful links like how to build Angular 2 apps using observable data services. And the ones above that are just basic Rx stuff not related to Angular 2, but also useful things if you want to learn more. Okay, yeah, that's it. Any questions? Yeah? If I'm not wrong, currently there are two different repositories for RxJS, one maintained by Microsoft, the other one mainly by Netflix. Is that correct? No, I don't that? think so. No? Actually, uh, or I'm not aware. Okay. I think Rx, Rx Java is maintained by Netflix. Sure. But RxJS, well, they are both open source, so. Uh, yes. Yeah, but. Yeah. So, I uh, one question about yeah. like related to generators in, I think it's ES7 or spec, but. Um, so there you, the goal is to kind of streamline input and output so that you don't work with events in that case, or in that sense, so how does this work with the new spec coming up in future JavaScript versions? Do you have any, have you like found any blog entries or anything related to that? No, I, I, don't, I don't think so. I haven't heard anything related to that, yeah. Just something that I can think of. Um, yeah, yeah. Went to um, HTML DevCon, was it um, a bit over a year ago in San Francisco, and there was a guy from, I think he was from uh, Google, and he had a, th had a talk about like all the new ease features. Okay. And said that it's kind of radically changing the way they're going, so I don't know. But maybe we'll, usually people find a way around yeah. new specs and other things. So. Yeah. Still a pretty cool concept. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Have you have you by the way found out on the games um, using RxJS because there is um, even if this is pretty you like pretty common problem in, in apps, it's a even more common problem in games. I don't. Uh, I've just seen few simple like proof of concept things, not okay. not like an actual real game with, with a big code base but there are like uh, for example the, this playful introduction by Eric Meyer it's a presentation that uh, where he kind of builds a small uh, 2D game where you can run and jump and stuff like that so it, it's a cool talk so it, it, that you might want to check that out it, it really shows how, how Rx or observables are is a useful pattern for, for also for game 
development because games are naturally reactive. They react to things like mm. when different things collide, you have opponents or you have to collect coins or stuff like that. So you need to be aware when they react with each other. So it's a, it's a useful pattern for that also. Yeah, it's usually a lot of for loops. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I have to check the intro. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. Yeah. During this time you worked with RxJS, did you ever feel the need for writing a custom operation for whatever reason? No. Or everything is fine? No, no. Uh, I haven't used it that much, but all of the things that I have used it for, I have always found some way of doing it. So there are a lot of operators in there, as I said. So yeah. And obviously you could write your own function inside on, but I guess as one's question is uh, more like that, could you extend this uh, RxJS by, by making this kind of operator yourself? I'm not sure if they have any like uh, way to add, you know, like official way to add, but of course you can just add stuff to the prototype. Mm. It's, it's JavaScript. <laughs> <laughs> the same way that you can put stuff in array.prototype or string.prototype. You can just put observable.prototype and add your own stuff there. So mm. I guess it the best way is copy one of the existing Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then change it. Yeah. Okay, so for example, if you have a uh, like a, a data service for for you have a, a list of some things, and then you can add and remove and edit those. Yeah. So you would have the service, and uh, the service could have a like an internal representation in normal li list. And then you can put stuff in there or remove them from there, and only it will emit the whole list in a new ah, okay. event. So every time that a new event comes from the observable, it will be the whole list in its current mm -hmm. state. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So that's kind of the way to do it. Have you looked at NGRX? Like the Redux type of thing with streams for Angular. A little bit, not that much, but yeah, it looks really promising. It's kind of like the yeah the Redux type of thing, but done with observables for Angular too. So <coughs> it looks promising and and uh, could be really useful. You can kind of implement something along those lines, even yourself, like. Just writing a, a, a service that, or you, you don't have to go like the, your whole application puts the state in a single object. You to write a service that acts like kind of like that for a single set of components and has the st state related to one piece of things, and uh, the service then has uh, methods to add or delete, which are kind of like the events in in Redux, and then emits an observable. Which is the state, uh, but yeah, NGRX is is looks really good, <coughs> but haven't I haven't used it yet. Okay. Yeah, that's that's it. Then no more questions. Okay. All right. So let's have ten minute break and then the next talk and there are refreshments there mm -hmm.